What up everybody, Demon back, and welcome to the first episode of a series, a long-running series, that I will be starting as of today, and running for multiple months, um, until the end of the year, pretty much, or at least until the end of the school year, um, because that's typically how long it takes me to do my, um, marathons anyway, so, welcome to the first episode of my Godzilla-thon. Each episode, I will be doing an in-depth breakdown slash review of whatever Godzilla movie we are on that specific week. Um, whether it be Gojira as in today's episode or Shin Gojira as in the last episode. Um, so each week I will upload a review for for a Godzilla movie. Um, starting with Gojira and then just working my way through the series. Uh, I will only be doing these reviews on weeks that I have school. That way, if I have a week off of school, I can focus on doing other things. This way, I can provide year-round content, but at the same time, I can take it easy during the school year and not have to worry about YouTube and just focus on my school life instead. That way, I get good grades and all that stuff, and that way, I'm still able to do these YouTube videos and not have detention or summer school or whatever I'd get for uh, failing my classes. So, um... What I'm going to be doing in these reviews is I'm going to be breaking them, breaking these movies down like this. I'm going to start out and I'm going to give an in-depth plot description of the movie. Then I'm going to break down the characters. After that, I'll give a little bit of background on the movie. For Gojira specifically, today's episode, we're going to spend a long time on the backstory of the movie because it is very important. Then moving on from that, we'll get into some of the other things like um, the special effects, the music, um... And then the allegory, if if the movie has any. So, like I said, very in depth. Um, and and the reason why is just because I feel like at a certain point, if you're a Godzilla YouTuber, you eventually have to do a Godzilla review for each movie. And what better way to do it than just in depth get all of my thoughts out there? That way, I never have to revisit it again. Not that it'd be a terrible thing to revisit it again. It's just so that I can get an in-depth comprehension out to you guys. That way you know, personally, why I think certain Godzilla movies work, don't work, why I love Godzilla in general, and all that stuff. So, um, I guess before we begin, I want to mention the fact that I think the original Gojira is the best Godzilla movie ever made. The best kaiju movie ever made. I think it is probably... I'd go as far as to say the best giant monster movie ever made, possibly even the best movie ever made. Um, and I know those are each significantly bigger steps. The best Godzilla movie ever made, I don't think anyone will deny you that. Whether or not you like one more than this one, in my case, I specifically like some, or, or at least one more than I like this movie, and we'll talk about that in a later review. Um... Or if you like other giant monster movies more, I don't think you could argue that this is at the very least the most well-made, well-put-together, well-crafted, just all-around great monster movie. Whether it be the story, the music, the acting, any of it, none of it falls flat. Um, there's certain movies that you might love um, or you might hate. You could make your argument for why King Kong would be the greatest monster movie or greatest movie ever made. Um, but I don't think it works as well as this movie. I think this movie is timeless. Um, I think this is just one of the best movies, probably the best movie ever made. Now, is it my favorite? Absolutely not. That's for another review. So, we'll get into why later. When Once we get through all of this stuff and I start talking about uh, why each individual aspect works or doesn't work. But at this point, I just wanted to get that out there, that Gojira is probably the best movie ever made. Um, it has great allegory, great themes. Um, great. It's a very deep movie. It's, it's a good movie. Great special effects, great action sequences, uh, compelling story, compelling characters. It's just, there's no denying it's an amazing movie. Now, moving on to the plot description. Um, this will be, I'll, I'll do an in-depth plot description for each episode, that way if people haven't seen the movie in a while, or just have never seen the movie in general, they don't feel like they're missing out. So, that is why I'm going to be doing this. Alright, now, Gojira. It starts off, 
we have a ship. There's lots of sailors on it. We find out later that this is a fishing ship. Uh, fishing ship. Um, all of a sudden, a giant white light erupts out of the ocean. The ship is set on fire, sank. All of the sailors die. Now, this sets out panic at the South Seas Salvage Company. People are wondering what's going on. Multiple more ship crashes start happening, or rather ship disappearances. Um, then a survivor washes up on this island called Odo Island. It is a small fishing village where they have this legend of this thing called Gojira. Now, Gojira is this god that lives out in the ocean. It is so horrible that back in the day, the elders of Odo Island used to take a young girl, put her on a raft, send her out into the ocean, and give her to Gojira. That way, he would not come on land and wreak havoc. This way, he would be fed and happy. Now, of course, as times change, so do customs. This didn't happen anymore. But the legend is still there. The mythos surrounding this creature is still living through the elders of Odo Island. A reporter gets wind of this of this information and heads out to this island. His name is Hagiwara. He is a young Japanese reporter who is looking for a big scoop. Um, after arriving on the island, he discovers the legend of Godzilla, or Gojira. Um, and then during the night, a big typhoon hits, sweeps straight through the land. Buildings are destroyed, people are killed. Um, one of the, the only survivor of a ship crash due to this white light, this mysterious light in the ocean, is also killed during the attack, or during the typhoon. Now, this man is the brother of Shinkichi, a young boy who is, at this point in the movie, orphaned, left alone. He's later taken into the Yamane family, but we'll get into that later. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, during this attack... Shinkichi's brother notices something outside of his window, something horrible, something so terrible that he couldn't even flee the house. As this house is getting destroyed, we catch a glimpse of something large, some giant leg moving across in the background as the house is destroyed. That is our first glimpse of the creature. Now, all of the survivors of this typhoon, or rather this attack, have been brought back and questioned in front of the scientific bureau to find out what's going on. Yamane, one of Japan's top scientists and paleontologists, is there. He hears of this legend of Gojira on Odo Island, and due to the fact that Hagiwara, a civilized man from Japan who went to the island, also claims that something living had to have done this damage, Yamane decides he'll send out an investigation team. So, Yamane goes back to Odo Island with um, Aguara, Emiko, and Ogata. Ogata and Emiko being um, the daughter and her boyfriend, um, the, the daughter of Yamane and her secretive boyfriend. Um, as they're taking off on the ship, we catch a sight of a scientist, a scientist that is later revealed to be Dr. Sarazawa. This is Emiko's um, her, this is the person Emiko is supposed to be marrying because back in the day there were customs where there were arranged marriages and this is the person who she was arranged to to be married to and although she does not love him in the term of a romantic interest she loves him and respects him as a brother um, this is made very clear in the commentaries and the behind the scenes and kind of the story of Godzilla, um, commentaries of Gojira. Um, now, she is in, she is in love with this, this young, geez, he's really not accomplished in his life. He is just a sailor. We find out later that he's a diver. He works for the South Sea Salvage Company and his name is Ogata. He has done nothing impressive in, in his life, whereas Sarazawa is a respected scientist and a war vet. He's missing an eye. So this dynamic here is very interesting how Emiko, although her the person she's arranged to be married to, is a very respectable man, she can't help but follow her heart. She can't help but fall in love with Ogata. And that makes her a very sympathetic character because she's stuck in between a rock and a hard place. 
Does she let go of the customs? Does she disappoint her father and her, the person who she's known all her life and been arranged to marry? Or does she follow her heart and go with Ogata? Um, it's, it's a very interesting love triangle here, and it plays a critical role in the ending of the movie. Now, as Yamane and his team get to Oda Island, they discover a footprint. This is just a massive footprint that is just swelling with radiation. The wells are contaminated, and all of the people who step in the well probably taken about a cancerous dose of radiation, although the movie doesn't exploit this. It doesn't try and make you fear the radiation. That wasn't the point of the movie. The movie wasn't an anti-radiation thing. It wasn't to, to exploit the fears of the people back in the day. It was simply an anti-war movie. So they did not draw attention to the fact, and even in Godzilla vs. Destroya, we find out that Emiko did not die. She actually survived, so she does not get cancer. Um, at least that we know of. So that's the good thing. The movie doesn't try to exploit your fears, even though in reality that's what would happen. Um, so, Ojira's footprint are discovered. They're discovered all across the land, but only one is investigated, and they find something inside of it, something called a trilobite, which is just an ancient crustacean-type creature, and it has been expected to gone extinct a long, long time ago. But the fact that it's here now starts to raise questions. It is at this point when a bell starts ringing and people start running up the hill to fight the monster because they know Gojira is in their town, in their village. So they start running up this hill with their weapons, getting ready to fight it. Yamane and his team go up with cameras ready to snap pictures. And then all of a sudden, Gojira comes over the mountain. He roars. Yamane snaps a picture of him. So does um, Hagiwara. And and it's just one of the best scenes probably in Godzilla history. Probably one of the most iconic scenes where you see Gojira roaring over this mountain and just everyone runs. Everyone who had the courage to chase up that mountain with weapons, they did not expect that. They did not expect a 120-foot monster to be standing there roaring at them. That is just not something they anticipated. So when it happens, everyone turns around, runs away. Emiko falls down. She's not killed. She's luckily gets away with Ogata. And like I said, Yamane and Hagiwara both snap picture pictures of the monster. Now, Yamane goes back and he reveals Gojira to the world. He reveals it in this scientific um, thing. Uh, it's, it's like a big conference, and he explains that there is this giant monster that's living in their world. It survived a nuclear bomb, and it should be studied, right? Well, the public seems to disagree, or at least the people in the room. And this is one of the interesting things. This is where Honda starts to criticize democracy, because there's a great debate that breaks out here about where... The people are arguing, there's one side led by a woman who's arguing, we need to release the information that Gojira was created, or at least awoken, by the bomb, by the hydrogen bomb. And at the time, you have to think, historically, who was testing bombs at that very moment? America. America was the key person, key people involved in waking up this monster, killing tons of Japanese later. Um, and so, at this point... A big debate breaks out over whether people think that A, or that, uh, that while well, everyone's in agreements that Gojira's, his being there should be released to the world. Everyone agrees that, yeah, we need to tell the public that there's a giant monster. But the thing that people disagree about is whether to make his origins available to the public or not. This is very interesting, because then you see Yamane just sinks his head. Yamane representing probably Honda in this moment just thinking, this is not why I brought this up, this is this is just not what I intended. That we should not be focusing on if his origin should be revealed. We need to focus on how to stop this, how to study this. Because Yamane doesn't want to kill Gojira. He wants to study him. Why did he survive the hydrogen bomb? That is something that is very important to him, because it could possibly save the lives of the world. And these people are just arguing about something so petty that he just can't help but think this is just 
this is not why why I brought this to your attention. And there's a great scene when he just lowers his head when the argument's going on. Now, the military decides, all right, we got to stop this thing. We got to kill this thing. So sailboats head out, and they detect for the radiation under the water. When they find it, they set off depth charges. These depth charges are huge bombs that go off under the ocean, and Gojira is presumed dead. Um, now there's this scene when Yamane kind of goes back to his house and slumps down. He's very upset because he thinks that the monster is dead. Uh, this is a great scientific discovery, the biggest in the world lost. At the same time, this is one of the most important things in the world lost because now they can't study it. Now they can't find out why did this thing survive the hydrogen bomb? How can we save lives using it? It's gone. Um, there's a scene, it's a great scene. He sits in the darkness, Emiko walks in on him, and she tries to offer some condolence, and he just, he wants to be left alone. Uh, very sad. Um, meanwhile, the public is celebrating. Everyone's happy, and there's this scene where people on a cruise are there. They're, they're celebrating. These people were seen earlier in the movie when they make a direct reference to Nagasaki, referencing Godzilla, saying that, oh, he's just like the bombs. And they're making jokes about it. And then they're partying on this boat. And it's great to see because it gives us a face for the public. It, it helps humanize these people because we've seen them interacting with each other. We've seen them in this world. Now we see their fate. Gojira rises up out of the water. And, and for those of you who are wondering at this point, I call him Gojira because I'm doing the Japanese review. Um, the, the review of the Japanese movie. He rises up out of the water roars and now he's headed towards tokyo um everyone freaks out but he doesn't actually make landfall he kind of he kind of disappears back in the water and and that was just basically us seeing oh he's back that's the public seeing oh he's back um he's, he's not dead after all now um we cut to Dr. Sarazawa's lab. And Emiko comes over to his house because she actually comes in order to break the news to Sarazawa that her and Ogata are going to get engaged and that their wedding is off. Um, it's a very commendable thing for her to do because, like I said earlier, she's taking a risk here. She is really stuck between a rock and a hard place, and she chose to follow her heart, which is the, prob which is the right thing to do, although it goes against the custom of the time. Um... So, Sarazawa silences her before she can tell him, and he says he needs to show her something. So he takes her into his laboratory, and it's just this very, like, Dr. Frankenstein-esque lab. It's an amazing set. It's beautiful. Um, she sees this fish tank, and he explains to her that he's been studying with oxygen and the effects and, and kind of the things that they can do with it. And then he sets off something in the water... So terrible that Emiko has to look away. She screams, and we don't know what happens. She runs out of the room crying. Sarazawa comes out. He consults her, and then she leaves. Um, it's at this point she goes back to her house. Her and Ogata are sitting there. Um, and Ogata expects her to have just broken the news to Sarazawa, and she's just devastated. And he doesn't know why at this point. And before they can even get kind of before they can catch up with each other on what just happened, all of a sudden, alarms start going off. Kojira is in Tokyo Bay. He is coming on land. Um, this is Godzilla's first attack. So, Godzilla, or Gojira, comes up on land. He destroys a bridge, some buildings, and then he's kind of somewhat chased off by jets. Um, so, it's at this point when we see just this thing just show up on land and destroy a huge area in the Tokyo Bay area. He destroys this, it's a bridge that's very iconic for Godzilla, um, the series, and it's this great sequence when he's just there. The music is just amazing at this point. And then he, he leaves back into the sea, leaving everyone in horror. Um, now we get some downtime. People wondering what they're going to do to stop this monster. 
we build some high tension wires around around the city. Originally, there were supposed to be some some more realistic, elaborate things, but they couldn't do it for time constraints. So, they build some high tension wires and they prepare for Gozero's return. Now, something that you could immediately draw a parallel to is Gozero's first attack in Tokyo Bay could be very closely compared to the very first atomic bombing. Although the first atomic bombing did more devastation, um, Godzilla is really the walking embodiment of the atomic bomb, uh, according to Honda. That's how he always viewed it. It wasn't an allegory for the atomic bomb. It was the atomic bomb. So that's, that's one thing to note, is that there's two attacks in this movie, just like there were two uh, A-bombs dropped on Japan. So... Now the high tension wires are built, and Gojira shows up out of the water, heads to the high tension wires, and it's at this point you think, they got him. He starts getting electrocuted, he roars in pain, and then all of a sudden, white light erupts from his back. The dorsal fins start shaking and lighting up, and then he releases atomic energy, this concentrated dose of atomic energy all over the high tension wires, it melts them, and now he is in the city. They weren't able to stop him. This is Gojira's or Godzilla's classic atomic breath, the first time it's ever used. And it's very good the way they waited to show it until now. So now the Tokyo Assault begins. Um, one of the most iconic scenes probably in film history. This is also one of my favorite destruction scenes in Godzilla history. No time has Godzilla ever destroyed a city as thoroughly as he destroys Tokyo in this movie. Everyone makes the joke, oh, Godzilla always destroys Tokyo. Not the case. He doesn't always destroy Tokyo, and at the very least, he never destroys it, like I said, as thoroughly as he does in this movie. He destroys everything. The, Hi the Hichigeki Theater, which was the theater, a big theater owned by Toho, um, so it must have been a very a very big shock for the people inside the theater at the time when this was being watched when they got to see the building that they were in be destroyed right in front of them. There's a very iconic shot when he steps on a train and then eats part of it or he, he bites part of it and then spits it out on the ground. Uh, he goes up, he's annoyed by a clock tower, he destroys it um, due to the fact that it starts ringing in his ears. Uh, there's this bird cage that he destroys buildings near. He, he takes a chomp out of a giant radio tower, killing everyone inside. It is just one of the best destruction scenes we have ever seen, and it's beautifully shot. The way they did it, they overcranked the camera and had the actors inside the suit move as fast as they could. Um, actor Harun Nakajima had the um, privilege of playing Gojira in this movie, although at the time he wouldn't have thought so, because at the time it was not a flattering role. But as the day, as years went on, it became one of his favorite roles, as stated. That one in Gaira from War of the Gargantuas. So, Gojira destroys the entire city, and then we get an aftermath scene. Everything destroyed. The city is leveled. Just, it's a dust-filled, just completely empty, dead zone. Um... Very, very reminiscent if you've seen pictures of Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the very first atom bombs were dropped on them. Very reminiscent of that. And like I said earlier, the way Honda, the director, viewed this is Gojira was not the um, allegory for the atomic bomb. He wasn't, he didn't represent the bomb, he was the bomb. So... And, and I know, I mean, that that meaning that saying might take on a different meaning as later movies, Godzilla's the bomb. But <laughs> um, in this movie, it's meant to be very serious. Um, so, the destruction is done. Death everywhere. During the destruction, there's a mother holding her children, and she says, Soon we'll be with your father in heaven. This is not meant for kids. This movie is not meant for little kids. Um, you have to be of a certain age to understand, comprehend, and appreciate what this movie is conveying. Um, it's a very sad scene, and this is clearly she's referencing the the, Jap the Japanese role in World War II. Um, soon you'll be with your father in heaven. The kids are about probably six or seven at the time. 
Um, this was about nine years after the World War II ended. This was exactly nine years after World War II ended. So these kids would have not really, well, I guess they would have had to have been if, if their father died in the war. But one thing they were trying to draw a parallel to is that lots of families lost people in the war, and now these people are going to die even after the war. So, surprisingly, not everyone in the family dies. We see the mother passed away at a later scene in the movie, and we don't see one of the kids, but we see the other kid, and she is crying. And it's a very heartbreaking scene, because as Emiko is walking through, nursing these people back to life, hoping that they don't die, um, someone walks up to the little girl with the Geiger counter and holds it out, and it spikes. The little girl definitely has radiation sickness, cancer, and she is going to die. There is no getting around it. Um, we don't see it on screen, but it is implied. Um, that's one thing that this movie does that rarely any other Godzilla property has ever done. Uh, it's very reminiscent, or there's a scene very reminiscent of it in the great novelization of Godzilla 2014. There's the miners from the very beginning. Um, there's a great scene when, when, uh, Sarazawa investigates, that Sarazawa investigates that area and he finds lots of miners held up in this small little area dying of radiation sickness. And that is a clear throwback to this scene. This is one of the most heavy, dark scenes of any Godzilla movie ever, just because of what implies. Child, death, death of the thousands, everyone in Tokyo gone, very few left. The people who can are helping. The people who are able to have to be helping these people, otherwise the death toll will just be even higher than it already is. Um, Emiko having to deal with this firsthand, having to help these people firsthand, this is when she decides to make the sacrifice. This is when the love triangle really plays into the story. Um, and it's, it's a, a great scene. Ogata comes over and, and starts to, um, ask her how she's doing, like, how she's holding up or whatever. And she reveals at this point what Sarazawa showed her. The thing that Sarazawa, earlier in the movie, made her swear not to tell any other human being not even until the day she dies she has to live and die with that secret and at this point she realizes she can't do that if the world's going to survive so she makes the sacrifice she takes action she tells Ogata about what she saw in Sarazawa's basement and then we get a great flashback sequence of Sarazawa releasing some pellets into a fish tank the pellets bubble and the music erupts and all of a sudden the fish are vaporized to turn into bone and then eventually nothing. This is the oxygen destroyer, one of the most iconic things in Godzilla lore. Um, and it's it's used in this scene for the very first time. Sarazawa is horrified about what he's discovered. He holds Emiko and, and even he is in shock seeing what's happened and he's the one who created it. He's the one who discovered it. Um, so... At this point, Emiko has betrayed his trust. Now, Ogata takes her over to Sarazawa's house. Um, Sarazawa heads up from his laboratory, sees Emiko, and you see a smile grow on his face. He's excited to see her because it's clear at this moment that he actually does love her. He actually does care for her. And at, the, at this time, we know he's suspected that she's going to break the news about Ogata to him. Uh, we, he suspects that at the point when she comes to tell him earlier and he shows her the oxygen destroyer. And it's at this moment when he notices Ogata in the room and his smile fades because now he thinks, okay, this is going to be the moment when people, when, when they're going to break the news to me that, that, that they're betraying me pretty much. That's what, essentially they're betraying him. And he thinks this will be the moment when the news is broken to him. But instead... Ogata asks him, you need to use the Oxygen Destroyer against Gojira. Um, Sarazawa is just immediately taken back. He starts to deny it, but he can't deny it for long. So he runs off into his laboratory, Ogata and Emiko chasing him, and he locks the door and starts burning papers, burning his research, hiding the information so that no one can ever find it. Ogata busts in the door, and as Sarazawa is going to destroy the only Oxygen Destroyer, Ogata busts in, and there's a fight breakout. We don't see it on screen. That's one of the great things about this movie is it's not meant to be an action movie. We're not supposed to see a hero and a villain because they're all heroes. 
Um, so the camera pans down to the fish tank of death as we hear the fight happen in the background. Um, when we cut back, Sarazawa has won, probably because he's a war vet, and Ogata is left bleeding from his head. Emiko goes and patches up the, the wound on his head, and we start to see now Sarazawa's conflict. He's horrified because of multiple reasons. He realizes at this moment that they know about the Oxygen Destroyer and they want him to use it, and he can't use it, about reasons we'll get into in a second. Now, at the same time, he's watching Emiko, the woman he loves, patch up her love interests, patch up Ogata, the, woman, the man she loves, and it just is really sad for Sarazawa because this is a moment when he loses everything. He's already lost his scientific career because he's too terrified about what he's found, discovered with the Oxygen Destroyer, that he is just not willing to come out and share any of it. He's not willing to, to do his job because he's so horrified of it. At the same time, he sees the woman he loves leaving him right in front of his eyes. Whether or not she says it doesn't matter because it's happening. Now, also, during all this... A prayer comes on the radio, or a prayer comes on the TV, actually. And it's a prayer, a beautiful prayer, sung by a choir of girls, and it's very haunting. Um, it's it's probably my favorite, one of my favorite songs from the soundtrack. Um, the song titled Prayers for Peace. Uh, it's also it inspired me enough to write a story, Prayers for Peace, a dark horror story about um, Godzilla, but it's it's a little different. Uh, it's it's not like it's different than the movies, and uh, it's just it's just just for fun. But um, it's just this great song, and Sarazawa is just destroyed at this moment. He realizes if he doesn't use the Action Destroyer, everyone's going to die. But if he uses it, everyone's going to die, and here's why: because he believes that. If he reveals this weapon to the world, he will either be forced to, people will either, A, um, force him to make oxygen destroyers to use as the next arms race, B, people will discover them on their own, and they'll be the super weapon that the world grows into using instead of hydrogen bombs, and C, that people will use the ones he already has against the world. And there's a great line when he says, bombs versus bombs, missiles versus missiles, and now a new super weapon to throw in the mix at all, or something along those lines. And it's just this great thing that really sums up not only his entire conflict, but the conflict of the movie, the allegory of the movie, this nuclear metaphor. And it, it's just, it's a great message, and... Sarazawa is one of the best characters in film history. He's the best character in Godzilla history, without a doubt. Um, now, Sarazawa decides that he has to use the Oxygen Destroyer, but it can't be at, at no cost. It can't be without a, without a price. Uh, the price must be paid. He burns all of his research. for It forces Emiko to cry because she realizes a sacrifice must be made. She doesn't realize what yet, but she knows a sacrifice must be made. Um, now, Sarazawa and Ogata head out into Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Bay, on a big ship where they plan to detonate the oxygen destroyer in the water. As the two dive, they find Godzilla or Gojira in his natural habitat. Um, he's just under the water, very peaceful. It's different than we've ever seen him before because usually in monster movies in general, um, the monster is lured out into the city and killed, where in this case, they go to the monster's habitat and kill it. Um, different than we've ever seen Godzilla before because it's the first time we see him at peace. He just wants to be left alone. It's clear that he wants to die. That's something that plays in much, much later down the line in uh, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, um, or Tokyo SOS also. But Godzilla just wants to die. He doesn't want to be Godzilla. That's one thing that people have to learn. He doesn't want to be Godzilla. And he's forced to be. And so Sarazawa, at the same time, he realizes if he uses this weapon, there is, there's no guarantee that the world will be safe. So, Ezogod is being reeled out of the water because his job is done. He only went down because Sarazawa is an amateur diver and he was only assisting him. Sarazawa detonates the oxygen destroyer. It goes off. 
and as it's going off, they try to reel up Sarazawa. And Sarazawa's last words, goodbye or uh, farewell, be happy together, um, as he says to Emiko and Ogata, because at this point he reveals he knew the whole time that those two were in love with each other. And it's a very tragic moment. He pulls out a knife, cuts his diving line, and he's dead. Um, vaporized, probably, due to the fact that we also see Godzilla, who or Gojira, who now rises out of the water. He's roaring in pain, he falls back in, sinks to the bottom of Tokyo Bay, and then disintegrates. It's a very sad moment. The movie does not end on, end on a happy note. And so Godzilla's, or Gojira's dead, and at that point you'd think that all the heroes would be like celebrating this this victory but instead it's a very quiet scene on a boat when everyone removes their hats um, in in honor of the fallen doctor um, um, Ogata and Emiko are there Emiko is crying and Ogata is just trying to offer some uh, condolence and and it ends with Yamane Dr. Yamane saying that if the world continues to use nuclear weapons, another Godzilla is bound to wake up. And that's the ending of the movie. It really is just... <laughs> it's not a happy ending. Um, and even the most recent time I watched it, just a couple days ago, for this review, I even turned off the movie thinking to myself, that is a sad ending. Um, Surizawa... Yes, he commits suicide in a very noble fashion. He does it because it saves the world, essentially. He knows it will save the world. <laughs> but when he dies, he has nothing. Like I said, he has lost his job as a scientist, his respect as a scientist because he's so terrified of the Oxen Destroyer. He's lost his love interest, Emiko. He's, he's lost an eye. Um, he's just He's lost everything. And when he kills himself, he even has to lose his life. So, although he is the hero of the movie in that respect as he kills the monster, he's a very tragic character. He's one of the most well-written characters of Godzilla history. He is the most well-written character of Godzilla history. And um, he's my favorite character of Godzilla history. And... I don't know. It's just a very, it's a very sad moment, um, and and I guess that brings me into Sarazawa, our first character that we're going to be talking about because that is the plot of the movie. So Sarazawa, our first character, um, like I said, he's the greatest character in Godzilla history, the most well written, the most three dimensional, and he has very little screen time in this movie. He has probably two full scenes, three full scenes. Um, one being when he reveals the Action Destroyer, two being when they go and confront him about it, and three being his own death. So, he is, just the fact that he had probably, he, he had a little bit more screen time than that, but those were his big moments to shine. So, essentially, he has three scenes in this movie, and he steals the entire series, really. Um, no character that was ever written after him compares even slightly, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Sarazawa is just, it's, it's great, and I really wish that they could have done more with him. Um, I'm glad they went with the route they went, because originally the man who played Ogata was supposed to play Sarazawa, and Honda realized that would have been a mistake, so he switched the roles. Also, um, the fact that um, Sarazawa was given more screen time than he was originally supposed to have... Uh, is the really good thing, because in the original story, Sarazawa was hardly ever seen. Um, uh, yeah. In Kayama's first draft, Sarazawa was hardly ever in it, and we'll talk about that in a second here. Um, now, Ogata, our second character. He is a great character. The actor is one of the most well-known, well-recognized characters or actors in Godzilla history. Um, he has appeared from movies from this movie all the way to Final Wars. He was supposed to have a cameo in G14. They cut him out. I'm sure he will have a cameo in G16. That movie has not come out at the time of me recording this, so we'll see, hopefully, um, because he, he's one of the only living founders of the Godzilla franchise, so it'll be great to see him return, hopefully for one last role. Um, 
Ogata is a good character, but they don't do a ton with him. This movie really is an ensemble cast. It doesn't focus on one character as your lead or one character as the villain or hero or anything like that. There's no villains in this movie. There's no real heroes of this movie either because everyone's given their own moment to shine. Ogata's moment is when he confronts Sarazawa about using the Oxygen and Destroyer. That is his best moment in this movie. He's a great character. He's not as sympathetic as anyone else, um, really, that we'll talk about. Um, other than one character who has no sympathy, really. Um, he's not sympathetic. He just is a good man. He he does things because he knows it's for the betterment of the world. Um, when he talks about wanting to kill Godzilla, he gets thrown out of Emiko's house. He gets thrown out of the family that he's trying to build a part in. Um, all because he disagrees with Dr. Yamane, but he does it because he knows it'll save lives. Um, he's a great character. Now, Emiko. She is probably the second most three-dimensional developed character in this movie. Um, she's also great. She's very sympathetic in the fact that she's trapped between a rock and a hard place. Um, the tradition or her love for, for Ogata. Um, so she's a great character in and of herself. And her moment to shine is when she tells Ogata about um, the Oxygen Destroyer. Yamane is probably... Besides Sarazawa, the best scientist we have in a Godzilla movie. Um, not that he does a ton, it's just that he's also a very developed character. He sees the value in, in Godzilla when no one else does. He sees that there is things that can save the, the world by using Godzilla, by, by finding out why he survived the hydrogen bomb and all that stuff. And no one else realizes that, and that adds a layer of tragedy to him. Um... Um, Shinkichi, the orphan kid, he's a very sympathetic character because his whole family, his whole home was wiped out during the typhoon in the beginning of the movie. He's adopted by the Yamane family, but that's not his family, although he does seem to enjoy life with them, as we see brief clips of him in the movie uh, after the beginning point. Um, he, he still has a very big layer of tragedy to him in the fact that his whole family died. Um, and, and his house was wiped away all because of Godzilla. Now we have our last character, Hagiwara. He's just a reporter. Nothing really special about him. Um, even a lot of his, his role was written out during the American 1956 version of this movie, Godzilla King of the Monsters. Um, because it is kind of an unimportant role, he shows up, discovers the legend of Godzilla, and then he's not really seen much again throughout the whole movie. One more character to touch up on before we move on is Godzilla himself, or Gojira. Um, he's not really given tons of characterization in this movie. Really, it's all left up to fan speculation. Um, as we know in the original script, he was just kind of powered by hunger, so he didn't really have much of a personality other than he was just this big, hungry monster that would come on land and kill people in search for for food and then um and then during the movie the only kind of characterization he's given is like this unstoppable force of nature who is the nuclear bomb doesn't represent the nuclear bomb is the nuclear bomb and it's really up to fan speculation saying does he have ptsd is that why the lights of the cameras when he's at the um radio tower affect him is that why the original script called for him using or them using flashlights to lure him from place to place? Is that why he gets enraged by the um, the bell tower? All of these questions people are just left speculating because does Godzilla have PTSD to, to, due to the bomb? Maybe, probably, um, but we don't know because it's not confirmed in the movie. Um, so Godzilla's character doesn't really seem to develop in this movie. We just get a general Godzilla's a force of nature who's just this BA destroyer in this movie. That's all we get. And it will really take until Mothra vs. Godzilla and beyond, in my opinion, for us to really get a characterization for Godzilla. Um, even Mothra vs. Godzilla's a little bit iffy. So probably from, um... Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster on 
is when we get the real characterization of Showa Godzilla. But at this point, he doesn't have much of a characterization outside of just this force of destruction, force of nature kind of thing. Um, and that's the other thing. I want to be breaking down Godzilla's character throughout movie to movie. And from, from every um, incarnation of Godzilla... From this movie until the last, I want to talk about his character in the movie and what that means for us. And so that's the other thing I'm going to be doing in this series. Um, now let's talk about kind of the background history of this movie now that we've gotten that out of the way. And, and yeah, we are running um, quite a lot of time here, but that's expected. It's one of the greatest movies ever. There's so much we got to cover in so little-ish time. And besides, um, this might be the only video I'm able to upload for a week. I don't know how the weeks are going to go because I haven't started school yet. So... Um, at this point, that's just how it might go. I don't know. We'll see. Um, the original story. Um, the original story, Tanaka went to... Um, Tanaka went to Kayama, who put the story together first. Tanaka is the founder of Godzilla. He's the one who created the idea of it. A lot of people give that credit to Honda, which is not true. Honda was brought in towards the very end of production, or towards the very end of pre-production. Um... But, um, in the original story, Godzilla is mostly characterized by his hunger. He's motivated by food. He comes on land in search of food. There's a scene when Godzilla roars over the mountain in Gojira. The original cut, he was eating a cow because, um, that's just the way he was. Uh, he was just motivated by food. Yamane was not a sympathetic good good man. He was in fact a mad scientist. He ran around in a cloak. Wore uh, he lived in a gothic mansion. Um, he even sabotages the high tension wire mission. Uh, he tries to just save Godzilla because he's a mad scientist. Um, yeah, he sab he even tries to sabotage the high tension wire. Um, there's no love triangle in the original story. Uh, Godzilla is shown right away, and there is no build-up before the first, uh, reveal of him. He, um, yeah, he does not get attacked by the military, uh, they kind of realize their efforts would be useless. Um, he has huge ears, something very weird. This is just probably because of the bell tower scene, and Gorgo kind of translated that later on with the giant ears. And Godzilla attacks a lighthouse to start the movie. Um, very reminiscent of The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, the movie that helped inspire this one. A lot of people give the credit to King Kong, the 1933 movie that was later released in the 50s and did even better in the 50s than it did in the 30s, probably because at that point the uh, Great Depression was gone. Um, so, at this point, monster movies were on the rise. Besides, America was making tons of giant monster movies due to the radiation scares like uh, The Amazing Colossal Man, 50-Foot uh, Woman, all that good stuff. All those cheesy B movies, um, Them, The Ant Movie, um, just tons of it. And the one that came out the year before that, probably one of the most influential movies other than Godzilla and King Kong, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, 1953. Um, lots of elements were taken. Really, the general story was taken from that movie. Um, although this one gives it more depth, makes it much better, adds the allegory, and is just all around a better movie with, I would say, better special effects. Um, so, Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. What's the story? Well, a giant monster is awoken by nuclear radiation because of a bomb. Um, goes on land, destroys things. Goes back to the ocean, comes back again, and... And in that story, he's killed on land. Um, in this story, of course, he comes back again, kills everybody, goes back to the water, and then they kill him. That's pretty much how Godzilla is different. Um, but the general outline, giant monster awoken by nuclear bomb, goes, attacks city. Um, that's all stolen. Not stolen, I'd say adapted from that movie. Um, so he destroys the lighthouse, which was also in Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Um, this is the first Japanese film to use storyboarding because they could not conceptualize the visual effects without it. Um, at this point, after they had all the storyboards and all that stuff done, then they got Honda. Um, Godzilla was supposed to show up when, um, when Emiko and Ogata are at the beach. This is in, 
Um, at this point, we're in the second draft of the movie. So Godzilla was supposed to show up when Emiko and Ogata were at the beach. They were supposed to think his rock was a giant tail. This is the beach at Oda Island, by the way. They were supposed to think his rock was a giant tail, or his tail was a giant rock. And then all of a sudden, they saw this rock just shift away behind the island. And I think that would have been a great scene to see. But I don't think it fits in this movie. I think that would be a great scene to see in a different Godzilla movie, modern day maybe, um, or just one of the older ones. If they could have incorporated it, it would have been cool. Uh, maybe Shin Gojira will have a reference to it. I doubt it. Doesn't look like it. Um, anyways, moving on. Um, so they were supposed to th think that it was a rock. Um, Gojira had a cow in his mouth when he attacks. Um, his atomic breath is real is revealed on the hill before Yamane um, leads the crew leads the crew to the seashore where they check out um, the footprints where Godzilla walked back into the ocean, um, and that was the end of the original script or the uh, second draft of the story. Um, also, during the ending part, actually, there was another difference that was supposed to happen. The uh, Sarazawa and Ogata were supposed to lure Godzilla to the deepest depths of Tokyo Bay by using flashlights to bait him down there, because in the original story, um, bright, bright light affected him, it, it agitated him. A lot of people have contributed this to the fact that maybe the monster has PTSD due to the fact that it was exposed to the nuclear bomb, which would also explain why later in the movie the clock tower and the birds both agitate the monster. Um, this We already know that, that Godzilla has been affected by nuclear bombs due to the fact that um, he's deformed. We know he's deformed because of the way the, they, um, they came up with the original designs and they just wanted something that looked like nuclear radiation uh, hurt it. So, they lead him to the bottom of Tokyo Bay. Um, this was due to the fact that, uh, according to the original script, the action destroyer could only be used from the deepest depths of Tokyo Bay for one reason or another. Um, lots of people speculate that's just so they thought Godzilla wouldn't be able to surface in time to get away from the effects of it. Um, the movie was supposed to end, Serizawa was still supposed to kill himself, um... But the movie was supposed to end with Emiko and, and Ogata flying over in a helicopter, flying over where Sarazawa died and dropping a reef into the water. Um, Gojira was to evaporate and... Um... Oh, Gojira was also in, in the original uh, screenplay, or not screenplay, but the original uh, storyboards for the movie. He was supposed to um, vaporize people with his atomic breath, which would have been gruesome for the time. And um, he was going to throw the train car to the ground, and it was going to explode, and we were going to see uh, death. And that is things that were just too much for the time, so they cut him out of the movie. Um, as for Godzilla's effects, as for the way the visual effects were done, this was the first time Sumation was ever really used as a giant monster movie. In a giant monster movie. Um, yeah, so it's a very impressive movie. The first time they they ever did a nuclear bomb allegory in Japan due to the fact that there was American censorships at the time, um, or at least years before, two or three years before there were during the occupation. Um, this was the first time they used storyboarding, uh, first time they used suitmation. It's just a really impressive movie if you think about it. Um, so the way they came up with the design, they combined a T-Rex, Pteranodon, and Stegosaurus. Um, they gave Godzilla a, a, an odd texture because of the disfigurement that would have happened to him due to the bombs. Um, the original suit was about 6 feet tall and wasn't movable. It was over 220 pounds, and um, Haru Nakajima collapsed in it, and they had to rescue him out of it. Um, the second suit was made more human-like. The original suit was like um, bent over more to give Godzilla more of a threatening pose, kind of like GMK had... Um, so the second suit was made, it was made more human slash dragon-like, that way uh, Nakajima could stand upright in it. Um, could only move in a straight line, he could never turn in it, uh, so anytime we see a turn, we see a different angle of the suit, like a low angle of just the bottom half of it, which was actually the original suit. They used the original suit, they cut it in half, so he could wear it like big suspender pants, that way he could walk around and do the low shot scenes without us, or without him having to uh, suffer. 
Um, Nakajima would often pass out and they would drain buckets of sweat out of the suit. So that's the behind the scenes kind of pre-production history of the movie. Now getting close to the wrapping up here, um, the design. The design of Godzilla is really good. It's classic. I'm glad they went with it. Originally they were thinking it was going to be a frog, kind of salamander-like, um, and that would have been terrible. That would have sucked. So I'm glad we got the dinosaur and dragon that we got. And I think no one's going to argue that thanks to this movie we got all of the rest of the Godzillas. Whether you like this design or not, at least you can say the design you like was inspired by this design. Um, whether that's good or bad, ha <laughs> Shin Gojira, um, but there are great designs that came out of this, this suit, um, or not this suit, but this design, there are great suits that came out of this design, um, so the design is good, I really like it, I just don't, I think it's one of the, I don't think it's the best Godzilla design, I don't, uh, a lot of people will say it's the classic, you can't beat the classic, I think you can, there are certain designs that I think are better, we'll talk about them when those movies come up, um, the music by Akira Ifakube, or Akira Ifakube, however you want to pronounce it. Hands down, the best composer in the world. Hands down, probably the best music maker in the world. Um, just the horror, the excitement, the fear, the just the sadness, everything he's able to invoke in you just through the music alone is one of the most impressive things about this movie. The music really makes this movie. Um, without Ikira Fukube, if they had someone else, if they had Masaru Sato, if they had some random dude, it would not have worked. There's no way it could have worked to the success that it worked in this movie at the very least. Um, this is, like I said, the probably one of the best Godzilla scores in history. Probably one of the best scores in film history. Um, although some people say that this is the best um, score in film history slash Godzilla history, I would argue, I think certain scores, Godzilla vs. Mothra, a couple others, are better than this one, but they're all expanding upon what if Ifakube starts in this movie. Um, so it's just great. It's classic. It's amazing. Now, um... So there's a huge misconception. We started to talk about it earlier. There's a huge misconception. A lot of people think that Honda created Godzilla because he was the director, and he's the one who's most notable because he added the allegory into this movie. But he did not create Godzilla. I mentioned it earlier. Godzilla was created by Tomiyuki Tanaka, um, and, and he is the producer of this movie. And I think it's really selling him short whenever people don't give him the credit. Whenever people give Honda the credit, Tanaka's the one who deserves it. Tanaka's just, um, he's great. And by the way, earlier when we were talking about the effects, the effects were done by Eijin Tsuburaya. Some of the best effects in film history, when you really think about it from what they had, what, from the standpoint of that's what they had at the time, that's what they accomplished. Um... There's only one scene that I can think of in the entire movie. Some people mentioned that at one part you see the knee buckle. I've never noticed the knee buckle ever. Um, there's one thing that I noticed my most recent time watching this movie, which was uh, three or four days ago. There's a scene when you see Godzilla's tail outside of a window swinging up and crashing into a building. You do actually see the string holding the tail, but no other scene at all in the movie is there any sort of fail in the special effects whether it be the train scene, when they had to have a moving train being pushed by real people, while at the same time, um, Nakajima, or, uh, yeah, Haru Nakajima was supposed to step on the track right in front of the train at the exact time so that the pyrotechnics could explode and it wouldn't look bad because they only had one shot, one take. So, no other scene in the movie, even elaborate scenes like that, doesn't look bad. Even the typhoon in Odo Island, you'd think, okay, uh, how, how are you going to recreate a natural disaster to, to success? They do it. They create, they recreate a natural disaster to extreme success. It's incredible. Um, the waves that crash up against Odo Island, just amazing. That was, that was created because people would stand off screen with buckets. They just tip the buckets water would come crashing in onto the miniature and it looks great. Um, so Tanaka created Godzilla, um, Tsuburaya 
had the vision of what each scene would look like because he was the special effects guy. Honda had the idea of allegory. Kayama had the great writing. Remember at the very beginning of this review, if you've stuck around this far, you, you will probably not remember because it was about an hour ago. But at the very beginning of this review, we talked about how um, I thought this, this was probably the best movie ever made. This is why. No aspect of it falls flat. All of these things, the special effects, design of Godzilla, music, um, the people behind the scenes, the allegory, the acting, everything, every single aspect works. And it all works amazingly. Um, whether you want to watch it to study the allegory, whether you want to watch it because it's a monster movie, whether you want to watch it for the action, the horror, the sadness, whether you want to watch it for a character study, amazing characters in this movie, whatever reason you want to watch this movie, you won't be disappointed because none of it is bad. The only way you can be disappointed is if you hate, is if you hate movies like um, like black and white old timey movies. That's the only real way. Or if you're just like uh, against Godzilla for whatever reason, or, or just against movies like that in general, those are the only ways you're gonna hate these mo this movie because um, there, there's really nothing about it that doesn't work on some level. Um, so I do think that this is probably the best movie ever made. Is it my favorite? Absolutely not. Um, now let's talk about the allegory. So the allegory that Honda added in. Anti-nuclear. He was very against nuclear weapons for good reason. Uh, America, nine years before, just dropped two atom bombs on Japan and, and killed thousands. So Godzilla is representative of the, the nuclear weapons. Also, the oxygen destroyer is represented representative of the nuclear weapons the oxygen destroyer is the new weapon it's the it's more than than um than uh than than the atomic bombs could ever be and and you have to think i i mean we don't know what the oxygen destroyer would do on land but you gotta you gotta imagine it'd be devastating i know they say it only works in water but with slight modifications you could weaponize that thing um so you have to think about it like that, and that's why Sarazawa has to k kill himself. Um, so the Action Destroyer and Godzilla both represent nuclear weapons, and the damage that they cause is just immense. And that is where the anti-nuclear allegory comes in, also the anti-war allegory. This is not an anti-American film. Lots of people will say that this is an anti-American film. This is an anti-war film. It's not anti-American. There's no specific reference in the entire movies to America being the cause of any of this. You just have to know your historical facts for that for you to make that connection. Um, the New Japan. Japan went through a lot of changes. It was westernized, and back in the day we used to say it was civilized by uh, Western culture during the occupation. And the New Japan is represented in Emiko and Ogata's struggle, the way that those two are really breaking the tradition, and also in Odo Island, the way that the um, young islanders don't believe in the legend of Godzilla because that's the ways of the old-timey people. Um, one thing that this movie does really well is it shows human damage. The reason it shows the human damage is because it really wants to convey the message that War is terrible, and it doesn't want to just be like, hey, war is bad, stop the war. It wants to show it in a in a subtle way. The thing about this movie is it's not a PSA. It's not, it's, it's not just in your face um, against all this stuff. It's subtle, um, and that's the good thing. This movie puts the story first before it puts the allegory. Certain Godzilla movies later on will do it the opposite, and they fail. Now... Um, that's th this movie is just is just great and it shows the human damage it shows it's it's not Godzilla ruining the city it's Godzilla ruining lives and it's just it's a great movie it works so well um i just think that that you really have to not want to like this movie to not like it i don't get why else you would you would dislike this movie there's nothing to dislike um so, so yeah, th this movie is just, it's brilliant, um, and, and it wouldn't have worked if it wasn't put together with all the people that went behind it and all that stuff. It would have failed otherwise. Um, so yeah, so it's a great allegory piece. 
no or anti-nuclear, anti-war, um, the new Japan showing the human damage, all of that stuff. There was some other stuff I had to say, but I already forgot it. So um, this was not scripted. I just had some general notes, and I just remember. I just I just forgot one of the things that I was going to say. So and I didn't write it down. So. Um, that has been my extended review of Gojira. And one last thing to say as we wrap up here. Out of five, what do I give the movie? I think it's pretty clear after an hour of me going on about how great this movie is. I give it a perfect five out of five. This movie is absolutely amazing. It is a perfect movie. It is just incredible. I recommend it to every single person. All you have to do is give it a try with an open mind. Don't go into it like, oh, this is a Godzilla movie. I hate Godzilla. Or like, oh, it's a black and white movie. I can't stand old tiny black and white movies. Just go into it with an open mind and you will come out of it with some level of enjoyment. I promise. This is an amazing movie. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the first episode of my Godzilla-thon. Um, it's been ugh, an hour long, so um, if you guys didn't enjoy, um, you probably didn't stick around this far. And if you did, then good on you. I uh, hope to see you next episode where we will be doing a shorter review for the Raymond Burr version 1956 uh, episode that will be Godzilla King of the Monsters coming out some point next week. Stay tuned for that um, probably Wednesday next week. I think I'm going to start a Wednesday schedule for these. And, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed, um, this, this very, very in-depth review of, of Gojira. Um, the best monster movie, the best movie ever made. Um, once again, thank you guys all for watching. D-Man, out. Ooh.